Welcome to the presentation for Corrosion Protection, the 11th out of 12 training modules in the Underground Storage Tank Class A and B Operator Training Program offered by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. This presentation is narrated by retiree Spruce Wheelock. Now there are a couple of types of corrosion protection systems. There is the sacrificial anode or the impress current. We'll go over those two types and of course talk about testing and repairs. What is it? It's a change in physical properties such as transfer of electrons, moving that from the steel tank into the soil, which causes corrosion. That's the simplest way I can to explain it in easy terms for what we need for this class. Causes, provokes, hint, hint, something to think about. These are some things that really help the corrosion along. Soil moisture, pH activity, backfill material. Is it in clay or is it in, in uh, crushed rock or sand? Physical location. Is it in a swamp or is it in a dry place like Arizona where it never gets any moisture? One thing people don't really think about much is the scratching during the installation or transportation. You see, these tanks are coated with a protection material when they're built. Now, you deliver it to a site, it's got to be picked up on an excavator, it's got to be put in the ground, and it's got to be backfilled. Well, scratching happens, and it leaves what we call is a holiday. And that's where all the corrosion will start. Any place that, that bare steel can get in contact with moisture, the soil, basically water and moisture. What we want to do is protect your underground tank from corrosion. Here's an example of a tank that had been removed. The bottom half of the tank is extremely corroded and rusty and even got some holes. In the middle section, not so rusty, and the top section still has original paint on most of it. And I suspect that the groundwater in the spring rolls all the way up to about this point, wetting this whole bottom section of the tank and then, of course, as the summer went on, it dried out a little bit. So our heavy corrosion is on the very bottom. Because it was in contact with more soil and wet, moist conditions that cause corrosion. Sacrificial anode is what's installed on a new installed tank. What it is, is it's a more actively um, type of metal than the tank itself. So the anode sacrifices itself. It will corrode and protect the steel tank. And like Tim says, when well, Tim usually teaches this during class, is that the little guy here with a suitcase is carrying those his electrodes and he's going to the tank. So he's carrying everything it needs. So the anode is actually hauling stuff away, but protecting the underground tank, which is your cathode. Little hint here, anodes deplete over time. Yes. I always get a call now and then from a facility owner that says, uh, 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 my test failed. And my answer to him is, great, congratulations. And then people in the class look at me like, what do you mean? Like you're looking at me right now. Well, what that means is the anode, it did its job. It depleted itself and protected your underground tank. So that's a good thing. Your tank is probably not corroding away. Yes, it fails. Anodes will deplete over time and they will be expected to be replaced in order to protect your tank. So we want them to deplete. So that's a good thing. Here's an example of a factory installed anode system. Here's a very large tank, has two anodes, and they usually install from a factory on the ends of tanks. Now, the little guy's going shh. 
Here's a tank that's been removed. Anybody on, can read that? What does it say? Caution. Remove prior to installation. Huh? Well, when this tank was installed, the installer did not remove this plastic covering before installing the tank with this anode. Well, remember I was saying that in order for a corrosion protection place to work, and it corrodes, it is you got to be in contact with soil and moisture. Well, if it's wrapped with plastic, there's no moisture to this anode. So the anode will not corrode away because there's, there's no electrical process going on to protect your tank. So indeed, what happened here is this tank corrosion protection system failed because the plastic was still on the anodes and they had no electrical connection. So that's why they removed the tank. Now, a lot of facilities will want to say, well, did we add anodes or has there been anodes added to this site that I'm looking to buy? And if you're an AB operator, and you're doing your monthly inspections. Walk around your tank system and look for these, what we call saw cuts, and these round holes. Because what the round holes means, is that's where anodes were installed, and the saw cuts is where the wiring was to connect between the anodes. So there's been a upgrade here of some anodes added to this particular facility. In this case here, we have some anodes that were dropped down on the sides of the tank. Now the ones on the end are usually factory, but when they do an upgrade, it's usually put down around the sides of the tank. So this system had been repaired at one point or another. But as an AB operator, you're doing your monthly checks and you see those side cuts, especially in the spring. Make sure to take a close look at these. Because what happens is during the winter, Water and ice gets in here, freezes, and pushes these wires up to the top of the pavement. And guess what your snowplow does? Whoosh! Cuts those wires right off. Well, if the wires are cut, that means you have no longer have a connection from anode to anode to your tank. And so, therefore, your corrosion protect protection system is not working and needs repaired. So, please, please, always look around to see what there is for a especially especially in the spring. Now the second type of corrosion protection as I said was impressed current method. Now the impressed current method uses a system from your facility. In other words it uses your alternating current, your AC that you power that you have for your lights and so forth at your facility and it, your rectifier changes it to DC, direct current, and that is applied to your anodes and your tank. Same type of system except for instead of having dissimilar metals, you are pushing that electrical current with your rectifier. And again, the anodes will deplete versus the tank. Now, for an impressed current system, there's an additional thing that needs to be done it needs to have a bi-monthly log. So every other month, every two months, the facility AB operator needs to fill out this bi-monthly log. You want to check for amps and volts. Amps and volts. Here's a rectifier. Okay, there's an amp gauge and a volt gauge. Now, when you have your three-year testing, because these have to be tested every three years, have your tester write down and display it somewhere. What is your minimum amps and volts? Because if I'm going to go out there and read it every two months, I need to know if it's in this range. If it's out of this range, then I need to call up my tester and say, I'm outside this range. Can you come and adjust it? Because these impressed current systems are adjustable. And they will fluctuate from year to year, from month to month. You know, the groundwater comes up, groundwater goes down. It may need tweaking. The anodes start to deplete, so it may need to be boosted a little. That is normal. They will need to be adjusted. 
Typically, the rectifier will be found inside the building, not always, sometimes on the outside of the building. But impressed current usually is a add-on to an existing system, so therefore you have the saw cuts around the tank system with these anodes that have been installed, and it's all look for those saw cuts. This is typically an impressed current system. As I was mentioning, corrosion protection doesn't matter which type, either it's the impressed or the sacrificial galvanic um, system, we call it, needs to be tested every hint in three years until it's permanently closed, removed. Okay, I've never heard of corrosion stopping when somebody says, well, I put my site into temporary closure. Uh, does that mean the tank no longer rusts the corrode? No. It means until you permanently close, you need to do the three-year testing, even though you're in temporary closure. Hint, hint. Now, of course, metal piping is also needed to be protected. Now, if you've got fiberglass or a composite, which is a mixture of uh, materials, there is no metal there. So it doesn't need to be protected. It's not going to corrode. So when you do your three-year testing, we have a form that needs to be filled out and submitted to us within 30 days in order for you to be compliant. Again, testing. I go do inspections, and I say, you're in non-compliance. What do you mean? We did our testing. I says, I don't have a copy of it. So until we have a copy of the test results in our file, you are in non-compliance. So keep that in mind. This stuff needs to be submitted to us for you to be in compliance. Testing needs to be done and every three years. And it can be done by a CP expert. Now, there's different types of experts. They call it the, the NACE person or the, the PE guy. Now, there's a couple other types. The STI person. And there's the other one, which we call... ICC certified. All three types of certifications are okay for testing and testing only. Hint, hint. Okay. There are three types of certified people that do testing, and that's for testing only. Now, let's say your test. It fails. Well, within 30 days, you want to submit to the state it's failed, I need the results, what am I planning to do? Or have I already repaired it? I need that within 30 days. Or if it's not repaired within 30 days, on the 90th day, permanent close the tank, remove it from the ground, permanently close. You cannot operate a underground tank that has a failed corrosion protection system. So get the tank out of the ground if you're not going to repair it. Repairs. Hint, hint. CP expert only. Okay, the only type of certification allowed is a CP expert only, which is the NACE person or the person with a PE and experience. Okay, the ICC guy, etc. Cannot do repairs. So the only person that can do a repair is the expert. What we need after it's been repaired, of course, is an adequate passing test. And what was done? Give us a record drawing. Uh, the reason that it's hard sometimes to get the record drawing. We really de desperately need it. I've had some horror stories where they come in to a site and say, well, we got to do some remediation here because there's been contamination. The guy comes in under budget, gets it done. He says, it was great. What we loved about it was it was easy drilling. So we saved our money. Well, if there was no record drawing, the guy came in there and started doing the work. He found these nice round holes around the tank. Guess what he drilled down through? Hmm. Right through the anodes that were put in the ground to boost the system. So he destroyed the anodes, 
destroyed the corrosion protection, but he saved some money on his installation of monitoring wells for contamination cleanup. So it didn't work. So we need record drawings so we know what's there and also for any future work that's going to be taking place at this site. You need to submit plans to us if you're going to do a change. And that is to go from that sacrificial anode to an impressed current or vice versa. Because we need to review what you are proposing to do so you do not waste your money. We're trying to help you not waste your money. We need to review those plans to see if they're going to to work for what is required and, and for you. And of course, any time we have plans submitted, we need them at least 90 days before work is planning to take place. We need to have time to approve them. Causes. We talked about the pH of the material surrounding the tank. It also could have been caused by the installation or transportation of the tank getting scratched. It could be what is the tank installed in material such as clay, it's in a swamp, or is it in a dry place like Arizona where there aren't any contact with moisture or water. All those things do affect and help provoke corrosion. Materials needed for corrosion protection are basically two types. One is steel, and the other one's metal. And when we say metal is, people don't usually think of copper as steel. It's a metal, and copper does corrode and needs corrosion protection. So copper piping needs CP system added. Materials such as fiberglass or a composite tank, which means that there is no metal or steel that is going to be in contact with moisture, the soil, etc. Those items do not need corrosion protection. The two types of CP we talked about, one is the sacrificial galvanic type system, both are the same, and the second one was the impressed current system, which is driven by your AC current electricity in your facility. Those are the two main types that we talked about for protecting your tank system. Who can do the testing? Well, we can have the expert do testing, the nice guy, the, the other person, which was the PE with the experience. That type of person can do the testing. Also, there are the ICC person and the STI person. So all three categories of a person certified can do testing. Whereas repairs and maintenance to that corrosion protection system can only, hint, hint, be done by a corrosion expert. Hint, expert. They're the only ones that can do the maintenance and repairs. How often do we do testing on corrosion protection? Every three years. Okay. Doesn't matter which type of corrosion, either the galvanic or the impressed current, they all have to be tested every three years. Now, another little hint here in regarding to testing in general for all underground tanks. We have usually a minimum of three year testing and a lot of items that require testing are on an annual every year basis. So those are the two categories that you need to keep in mind. Three years or one year, all right? Corrosion protection is the category of three years. Questions? Well, you can always email me or give me a call, and hopefully I have a day before the exam that you could also ask questions. Regarding to testing, I also wanted to imply is on the impress current, we said you gotta do the three year testing like all systems, but on on impressed current, you could also remember you have to do the bi-monthly log. So every two months, you got to go in there, check your volts and amp reading. That's on top of your three-year testing. A little story I had regarding to doing an inspection, and I asked the AB operator, I says, where is your, your impressed current monitoring system? Oh, that's in the back room. I said, okay, let's go look at it. 
So we walk back down and says, where's your log? He says, oh, it's in there, in with the monitoring system. Okay. So we got to the back room, opened the door, flipped on the light switch, walked over to the impressed current system, flipped the switch, opened the door to the uh, monitoring, the impressed current monitoring system, looked at the volts, looked at the amp gauge, pulled out the record book of our log, of our bi-monthly log every two months, filled out the readings, initialed it, and checked it to what the tester had given him regarding to compliant regarding to operation. If it's within these ranges, it's functioning properly. If it's out, then you need to notify them for for adjustment. And they quite often need adjustment, like I said. Well, everything's fine. So we put the log back, we close the door to the impressed current monitoring system, flip the switch. Walked over to the light switch, turned the lights off, went out the door, and I said, hmm, something's wrong here. What is it? Let's back up a little bit. Okay, we had walked into the back room, turned the light on, walked over to the monitor, the impressed current monitoring system, flipped the switch, opened the door to the monitoring system, took the reading, closed the door, flipped the switch, walked over, turned the lights off, and left. Oh, let's see, back up again. Yes, we had flipped the lights on, walked over to the monitoring system, flipped the switch, happened to be the power switch to the monitoring system, took our readings, closed the door to the impressed current monitoring system, flipped the power off to the monitoring system, walked over and turned the, the light switch off. So in reality is, that impressed current monitoring system in, was only in operation during the time he was taking the readings. Uh, no. Your impressed current, if you remember from what I was talking about earlier, has to be on all the time to maintain corrosion protection. You cannot turn it off, even in temporary closure. If you shut the power off to a facility because you put it into temporary closed, you closed up the business and left, you still need power to your impressed current monitoring system because rust never stops. Uh, a little story on what I heard out in, uh, let's see, in the middle of the United States was once there was this huge contamination that, that took place and they were trying to investigate why the tanks had all corroded out and caused all this big contamination. Well, a lot of these impressed current monitoring systems have an hour gauge. And so when they looked at the hours of operation, they said, hmm, there's a problem here because the system was installed about seven years ago and the hour meter says it's been in operation for about two years. So therefore, the majority of the time that this impressed current system was installed and supposedly operating, it had been shut off. So therefore, the tanks had corroded and rusted out and caused contamination. So, hint. If you have a impressed current system, it has to be on all the time, 24-7, seven days a week, week after week, year round. When we hold in-house classes, normally this section is taught by Tim Norrie. And today you had me, myself, Spruce Wheelock, uh, teaching you on corrosion protection. Thank you for attending our training on corrosion protection module. Hope to see you someday in class. Thank you.